Hey, it's Nick here from Grayscale Gorilla, and if you've been following us on social media, you may have seen this render from Chad Ashley that he created to show off some of our beautiful materials in the brand new Pattern Canvas Material Collection. We had a ton of you out there asking for a tutorial on how to recreate this pillow stitching effect in Cinema 4D, and I was definitely one of them. So yesterday I decided to call up Chad Ashley and get a full rundown on how he created this effect. So what followed was an epic two hour call with Chad Ashley, where he showed me all the specifics on how he set up this animation, including some basic UVing, how he set up the stitching, how he made sure the materials looked realistic on those objects, and how he set up the lighting and final little details to make it look so warm, so soft, and so beautiful. So what I hope to do today is give you a condensed version of that tutorial so that you can follow along and learn some of the tips and tricks that Chad showed me on how to make this render. And I promise you there are things in here that you'll be able to use in all of your renders moving forward. All right, so with that, let's head on into Cinema 4D and let's get started. All right, here we are in Cinema 4D and let's get started by building the pillow that we'll use for this cloth animation. So head on into your primitives and select the capsule. And we want to make sure that as we build this pillow, that is, it is the correct scale. And you always wanna make sure you're using scale properly in your 3D uh, scenes, especially when you're using things like simulation and materials. So how big is a pillow? Well, to me, I don't know, a head pillow is kinda of like 15 inches. So let's go to height and say it's 15 I N and uh, Cinema 4D will convert it to centimeters, which is pretty cool. And then uh, of course the radius does not need to be that big. We could just shrink this down until we get something that looks, yeah, that should be good for now. So uh, let's do eight centimeters wide, that should be fine. Let's duplicate this capsule by hitting uh, Control C, Control V. And this second capsule, I'm gonna click the Z orientation and this is gonna give us our plus. And uh, this is still a little bit too large, so I'm gonna go to this radius and move it down by one, just to give it a little bit more space. Okay, so this is our basic shape. We also need to crank up the segments because we're gonna use this in a volume and we want this to be as clean as possible. So go ahead and grab your segments and crank them all the way up. And you could even add more if you want. Um, and so what do we do now? How do we make this one continuous shape rather than two separate pieces. Well, I'm gonna use the volume builder and measure. So with my mouse over here, I'm gonna hit Shift C to pull up my um, finder tool. This allows me to find anything in Cinema 4D just by typing it. So I'm gonna type in volume and right there, there's the volume builder. I'm just gonna double click on it. I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna open it up again and grab the volume measure while we're here as well. Okay, so next thing you need to do is with your objects selected, make sure you drag them into the volume builder. Now, the volume builder is uh, uh, basically combining all of this into one shape. And there's some settings here we gotta dial in. First is voxel size. If you're working at a small scale like this, you definitely wanna turn uh, down your voxel size. Even one centimeter is not enough to really get enough resolution here. These voxels need to be even smaller. So in this case, I'm gonna go to 0.1 that is looking better. And we also wanna smooth this out. We don't want this to be the sharp uh, edge here. We want it to be pillowy. It's gonna be a pillow. So how do we do that? Well, we add a SDF smoother. Just click this right here. It's gonna add it to the top of the scene. And if we turn up the voxel distance, it's gonna smooth that part of the pillow out. This is already looking more comfortable. All right, so now that we have this, how do we turn this into a piece of geometry that we can use in a cloth simulation. Well, first we need to make it geometry by putting the volume builder in the volume measure. And as soon as you do that, it's gonna make it real. It's now real geometry. Uh, and if we go to our display and turn on uh, shading lines, you could see it. we have a ton of geometry. And frankly, this geometry uh, does not work well with the cloth and soft body and the, the simulations. And the reason, it, it's because it's all um, various sizes, it's too dense, there's a lot of things wrong with this geometry for, for cloth. So how do we make this uh, more usable when it comes to the uh, cloth and uh, simulation? Well, we're gonna throw this whole thing in one more thing called a remesher. So, so again, I'm gonna hit Shift-C and type in re 
mesh. And it's gonna be right there in our search tool. I'm gonna hit enter this time. It's gonna add it right away. And I could drop this whole thing in the remesher. Now, the remesher is great. Uh, it's gonna look at this uh, uh, geometry and you can see it's calculating down here in the corner. This blue line represents it calculating all this. And if you just give it a second, it doesn't take too long. Uh, it will give you much better geometry. If we zoom in now, you're gonna see this is much more uniform and you're, you're starting to see some flowing between all of the, the pieces here in a much, uh, much more organic way, which is gonna help when we use the soft body. However, this is too much, uh, too much density. Uh, and you can see it's not symmetrical, as symmetrical as I want it to be. So how do we fix this? Well, let's zoom back out. Let's go to our remesh. And instead of 100% mesh density, let's go to something smaller like 4%. Uh, and this is gonna solve the density problem by creating less geometry. And if we let this calculate, you're gonna see it's gonna automatically be much uh, less dense and it's gonna be easier to use in a soft body, but it's still not symmetrical. You can see right here, we're not getting the flow in the symmetry that we really want. And so to solve that in our remesh, you can select uh, these symmetric um, axes. Now, you have to make sure that your object is symmetrical in these axes. So in this case, we have a fully symmetrical object. It's symmetrical X, Y, and Z. We could turn all of these on. However, if you make a shape that is, you know, different on the top and bottom or not symmetrical, you just want to leave that one off, okay? Um, so in this case, they're all symmetrical. I could turn them all on. And what's great is uh, this will give us geometry that is perfectly symmetrical. Check that out. And this is gonna help when we start to add the stitching and the UVs and the other stuff we're doing to this pillow. Okay, so that looks really good to me. I love this. I love it so much that I want it uh, out of this whole system and just into pure geometry. And so to do that, I'm gonna right click on our remesh, come down to current state to object and click it. This is gonna take this exact object and just make it one solid piece of geometry. And I could just turn all this other stuff off for now. And I could keep it if I wanna make different pillows, I could use the same rig. But for now, I have this piece of geometry that's ready to go. In fact, I'm just gonna bring this into a new scene just to start from scratch here and paste it in. And now look, we got our bit little pillow here, ready to go. Let's go to display lines. And let's start now to set up some of the stitching effects and the UVs so that the materials will look good on this. And we also get that nice stitching effect that is a really big part of the original animation. So now we're going to go to our edge mode by clicking on this on in your interface. And you want to go to loop mode. So for loop mode, I always use the key command U uh, on your keyboard, and then it'll show you all of your commands and L is right there in the menu, I hit L, and now I'm in loop mode. From here, you can see as I start to hover around my object, I'm getting different loops. And what this is doing is kind of tying together different strings of edges to try to create a, a loop around your object. And for this loop, I want this front piece right there, something like that. And what this is, is it's gonna start to build our edges and our stitching that allow us to make this look like it was stitched together with real fabric. And if you think about it, this pillow, if you were to make it in real life, you would make this whole front face out of one piece of fabric. And then maybe you would make this section here out of a different piece. And that's essentially what we're trying to do is build the lines of where the stitching would go in our pillow. And so I'm gonna start here by just clicking. And as soon as I clicked, I got my yellow line around this first piece. And this is a good start. I'm gonna rotate around and I'm gonna do the same for the other side, but this time I'm gonna hold down shift and this is gonna let us uh, select both of them at the same time, okay? And now, we're, now we need to build the, the stitches across the top and edges here. And to do that, uh, I need a different tool. For this, I'm gonna go over to our loop selection and instead of loop selection, I'm gonna go to path selection and I'm just gonna add more stitching across here. Don't forget to hold down shift, and if you make a mistake, you could always just undo, and it will go back to wherever you were. So I'm gonna click right here and start to make stitching essentially where I would sew this. Now, I messed up. I actually didn't hold shift down, so I'm gonna hit Control-Z, 
and I'm going to do it right this time by holding down shift. And now I get that new stitch. Uh, I'm going to navigate down here and do one for all of these pieces. I'm going to click and click again by holding, make sure I'm holding shift. And you're thinking like you're stitching this together, right? Like if you, uh, now I, I'm not, I don't know a lot about sewing, uh, you know, at home ec class, I made, I made a bag I'm pretty proud of. I think it's still, still in my basement somewhere, but I, I, what you're really trying to do is, uh, think about how you would make this with flat pieces of fabric, because that's what we're, that's what we want this to look like when we, when we do the stitching effect. Okay. So I'm going to do the other tip here and essentially this will be a separate piece of fabric. Again, I'm holding down shift and did we get it all? I think we got one more. Hold down shift. Boop. Let's move it up. Holding down shift and bang. Okay. This looks good. We got, oh, we got one more. Cross the top. There we go. Did it. Whew. Okay. Checking to make sure we got all the pieces. We got essentially all the different pieces that we need to start this effect. Now, I just got done selecting all this stuff and I don't want to, I don't want to lose this selection and I want to keep this selection uh, tied into this object so I could use it later down the road when we do UVing and when we do other effects. So I'm going to come up to uh, select, I think it is. Yep. And then come down here to store selection. And as soon as I do that, it's going to add this new tag to my object. Now this tag uh, allows me to, uh, if I if I had a different selection like this, for example, and I wanted to bring back that other selection, I could just select the tag and uh, click on select, and it's going to bring back that selection. Okay, so this is this is important. So now that we have that, uh, we can also set this up with a little bit of um, stitching geometry. We're going to do that right now, and then we're also going to uh, make a uh, UVs so that our our uh, materials are applied properly to the pillow, which is a major part of that effect. Okay, so two things we need to do. One is pull in this geometry just a little bit to kind of fake the stitching. So it's already selected. If you don't have all of the geometry selected, go ahead and click on select. And then just grab your scale tool. And because this object is so symmetrical, I could just pull in my scale just a little bit and now I get a little bit of pinching everywhere uh, on this object that just sets it off a little bit differently and kind of fakes this um, fakes this stitching. Now, with more detail, you can actually make more creases and get really detailed in here, but I think for this tutorial, that should be enough. Just that little bit of, of uh, scaling for this should be enough. Uh, for the next part, we're going to do UV, okay? And this is important because with with if you don't do this, your materials will not apply properly to your object, and it won't give you that fake uh, cloth feeling that um, you'll need for this type of look. So, how do you do a basic UV? This can be very daunting. UV is known to be a little bit scary, but I promise you, it's not as uh, tough as you think, especially with an object that is uh, straightforward like this. So, let's put some basic UVs together right now. To do that, uh, we can, with this selection already set up, ready to go, go into your UV edit tab. It's right up here in your, uh, comes installed, ready to go, right inside of Cinema 4D. And as soon as you're in here, you're gonna see what the UVs look like now. And you'll see that if you just apply a material now, it's going to be stretched totally differently over here than it is here and all these, everything's different sizes and it will not look the way that you want. Um, and this is really simple. Now that you have this selection here, all you have to do is come up here to UV unwrap and go ahead and click it. You can see now it took all of these uh, pieces that we selected and pulled them into separate parts. Just like if we were to make this out of fabric, it's now sitting here um, in different pieces, just like fabric is. And uh, you can also just click this again, UV unwrap, and it's going to kind of pull them together a little bit more. So this is pretty close. You can just use this as is, but I want to make sure that my 
patterns and my uh, my cloth is straight on this plus instead of on an X like this. So how do you straighten this out? Well, you could zoom in, and I'm just using two on my keyboard to zoom in, just like in 3D. And you could select one of these uh, um, uh, edges that are crooked and zoom out and then just click on Align UV Islands. And this is going to straighten it out. And you could do the same on this X. And I'm gonna select one, say Align UV Islands. I'm zooming out again, and we're gonna go into our UV Packing tab, which is right down here, and just click Apply, and it's going to uh, straighten everything out and make sure nothing's off the edge. Okay, so now that we've done all that, we have what looks like a pretty good UV map. This one's a little crooked as well. You can see this one got a little sideways. Let's go ahead and select it. There's probably different ways to do this. Like everything in 3D, there's many different ways to uh, do this. This is just a really straightforward way. I'm gonna go again, align UV islands, and I think we're good here. Okay, so now when our material is applied, you could think of it like when our cloth is being put onto here, it will it will uh, be uh, straight, and it will the patterns will look like they're being cut out of cloth, just like this. Okay, so I'm going to deselect everything up here just by going up to uh, select, and you can go to deselect all. And now we're ready to go. We now have UVs. We now have our um, stitching uh, effect going on. And now we can get into some of the fun stuff, which is the uh, cloth settings. Okay, so let's go ahead and on our object, uh, I went back to my standard uh, layout here just to start the cloth animation. And we're going to go to tags Simulation cloth, finally, Nick. I mean, come on, it's a cloth tutorial. Why didn't we do this to start with? Well, it's because we had to do a little bit of setup, but you'll see, since we did that setup, we get a lot of power now. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, if we hit play, you're gonna see, uh, I gotta unselect our object here. <laughs> Let me go to object mode. Um, it just falls to the ground. Why does it fall to the ground? Well, there's gravity going on. So let's hit Control D on our keyboard. This is gonna bring up our simula our attributes. Make sure you go to your simulation tab under scene, go to gravity and set this to zero, okay? This means now when we hit play, uh, nothing happens. Well, we want this to act as if it's a piece of cloth and not there's no forces, there's no gravity. So it's just sitting here waiting for uh, us to poke at it and do something else with it. So what can we do? Well, we can go into the cloth tab and go into the surface uh, menu and go to this target length. Target length, we could shrink down here and we could hit play. And now you could see it's um, shrinking down uh, our cloth and it's trying to make it much smaller than it originally is. This is not the effect we want. What we really want is for only the stitching to be shrunken down and for the rest of this object to kind of balloon up like a like a pillow or like a balloon. So let's go ahead and set that up. The first thing we need to do is make a, uh, a vertex map based on this setting here. So remember we made this uh, edge selection tool. Go ahead and click that, click select, and let's go back to our edge mode so we could see it. And you can see this selection we originally made came back. And now we're gonna use this selection to create a vertex map. So to do that, you can go to select, set vertex weight, and then type 100% in value. This is gonna say, hey, wherever you have edges selected, make the vertex weight 100%. Click okay, and you're gonna see we now have a vertex map. That is exactly where all the stitching is. This allows us to get really powerful now with our cloth settings. So in our cloth settings, under the target length, if we open up this triangle, you can see they added, Cinema 4D added this area that we could pull in a vertex map, and now the whole object doesn't have to be controlled all at once. We could tell the object which parts of it we want to be different, and that, this is what this map does. So now if we pull in our vertex map, into target length and we go back to frame zero and we hit play uh, and we unselect, um, let's go back to object mode so we could see it in action. It is now pillowing up. 
Let's get a little bit more um, frames here just so it doesn't repeat. Okay, so these uh, stitching is trying to collapse down on itself and it's letting the rest of it pillow up. So what are we missing now? Well, we're kind of like, we're missing the stuffing, you know, where there's, it's not the very comfortable pillow. It's just gonna collapse down uh, and there's nothing inside of it. So how do we build a little stuffing into it? Well, we can go to our ballooning and let's just turn it on. And by default, you're gonna see it does a pretty good job. It, it, it blows up our our cushion from the inside um, with a with a ballooning, which allows it to well, look a little bit more comfortable and more like a pillow. It's a little too much though, so we could dial this back. So let's try something like 0.75, and that is looking much better. And you could adjust this to taste. Uh, it all depends on how comfortable you wanna be. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so dial this up or down, and I'm getting some pretty good results here, maybe a little bit more, like 0.8 could be a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> and you can see it's uh, working pretty quickly here as well. Um, the new simulation is very fast and it's very efficient and it's it's really beautiful um, and, and super powerful. Okay, so now that we have this going, um, how do we start to uh, incorporate more animation and, and, and art direct it and start to push these things around rather than it just um, essentially just clumping up into a pillow. Okay, so let's uh, start to um, add more of these. So we could take our remesh and let's go back to frame zero and uh, you're we're going to just duplicate it. So I'm gonna hit control C and then hit control V, V, and let's do four of them. Sure, why not? I'm gonna grab all four of these and I'm gonna grab our place tool. You wanna to make sure you're, you're on object mode here. And uh, if you have this here, your place tool should show up and uh, it's actually called the dynamic place tool. This is place tool, dynamic place. Grab it and just simply click in your viewport and watch what happens. All four of these pillows now are respecting uh, their, their boundaries, okay? And this allows us to maybe pull one up, pull one down, and again, if we, uh, select them all, go to dynamic place and just click and drag around, it's going to uh, allow us to basically smush these together and try to create a little clump of pillows. Boom, there we go, that looks better. That's a better way to start. Okay, so what does this get us? Now when we back up and we hit play, check out what happens. Oh, look at the pillows. There we go, baby. Oh, it's looking good. Okay, so we have some cushioning, we have some pillowing, we have that stitching happening. Uh, where do we go from here? Well, this is when I, frankly, I, uh, I don't wanna look at gray stuff anymore. <laughs> this is usually the part of uh, when I'm building something where I go, okay, let's set up some, some uh, basic lights, some basic materials so that we could start to look at the IPR and kind of see where we are with the animation. Because right now we don't have a camera, we don't have lights, we don't know really anything here, but we are starting to see some really cool results. So let's go ahead and uh, just leave it right here. I think this is a good place to kind of start to build that. So I'm gonna go to my uh, startup layout now, this is my Redshift startup layout, and if you wanna know how I built this and you wanna learn how you could build your own layout, we have a, a, a YouTube video all about it. I'll uh, link it up in the um, upper right here and down in the description. Um, but essentially, it gives me all the tools that I use all the time, like the IPR, uh, some Grayscale Gorilla Plus plugins, and the library here, all ready to go so that I can um, Texture, light, do things very quickly here in cinema. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn on the Redshift IPR. If you're using a different third-party renderer, um, a lot of this stuff will work exactly the same. Just use, obviously, different lights and stuff like that. Okay, so in Redshift, what do we do? Well, first thing I wanna do is set up some basic lighting. So uh, I don't see the Redshift menu, which probably means we haven't turned it on yet. I'm gonna go into my render settings and I'm gonna go to Render Redshift. And then this uh, uh, tab essentially should be there. If it's not there, go to Edit, go to Preferences, and go down to Render Redshift, and you wanna make sure that this is turned on. Redshift Main Menu, turn that on. 
okay? That way, this will pop up when you turn on Redshift. Okay, now that we have Redshift turned on, we can go to Redshift and we can turn on a camera, okay? And this camera, we uh, probably don't want it default. You never want a default camera. You wanna start to think, if you were taking a photo of these pillows piled up on a couch, let's say, what lens would you choose? And if you uh, are, haven't been a photographer or, you, or like switched lenses on a camera, you might wanna learn a little bit about that. It does help uh, in any 3D render, understanding a little bit about lenses. We also have these tools here that let you pick really common lenses. Uh, so in this case, I'm just gonna use a 50 millimeter, which is literally a standard lens. And uh, it's a good go-to if you're not quite sure what you need. Uh, I'm gonna click 50 millimeter. This is gonna give us a little bit um, more control over our scene here. And of course, the next thing I need to do is set up some lighting. Not a fan of the default light. Let's go ahead up into Redshift and under lights, I'm gonna click on dome light. Now, dome light is already better than before, but it's all white. Uh, we don't want that. We wanna use an HDRI. So in your Redshift dome light, go to object. And then under texture, you can click on this uh, file menu here and you can go on your hard drive and you can pick any HDRI. In this case, I wanna use uh, our Grayscale Gorilla HDRIs and uh, be able to choose different ones. So if you wanna do that, all you have to do is drag texture into Drop Zone, which is another one of our plugins. And this allows you to um, have a live link to our entire library of HDRIs. So now you'd literally just can click on any HDRI and it updates right here in the viewport. Uh, in this case, I want to use uh, Creative Office, which is one of my favorites, what's one of my go-tos. I'm just gonna type Creative Office, click it, and you can see it automatically shows up in the viewport. And I don't want it in the background, so I could select my Redshift dome light, turn off background, and I could go into the coordinates and rotate it around until we have some nice lighting coming from the left. Okay. so. Uh, next thing I'm seeing is uh, we need to update the geometry here, and uh, we, we obviously need some uh, materials. So the geometry issue, let's solve that first. If I zoom in, you're going to start to see uh, that the geometry, like this is a good example, is starting to pinch, and it's making these really cool little pillowy marks, but it's the geometry itself is kind of poking through, and it, and there's just not enough of it. And rather than crank up the geometry here, uh, I want this to calculate very quickly, but I do need to smooth this out. So this is where I'm gonna use the Redshift tag. And I, there's Octane tags and Arnold tags that do something similar to this. I'm gonna select all of my pillows here. I'm gonna go to Tags, go to Render Tags, click on Redshift Object, and this will apply that tag to all four objects. Then down here, you're gonna see the Geometry uh, tab. And under the Geometry tab, you wanna turn on Override, you wanna turn on Tessellation Enabled, and in this case, I don't need Screen Space Adaptive. That'll slow me down in this case. Let's turn that down, or off. Uh, midge, uh, minimum Edge Length, I'm gonna set this to one, and Maximum Subdivisions, I'm just gonna say two. I don't think we need a ton of extra subdivisions. Uh, and if you do need more, you can crank this up, but I think this will work pretty quickly. Look at how much better that looks. And now we're getting all this nice pillowing and it's uh, nice and soft. We don't have any more jagged edges and it renders very quickly because it's doing it at render time rather than making it do all this calculation, okay? So let's zoom out, let's get back to here and let's start to talk uh, about the uh, materials. So I, I want, I don't wanna just see the tops of all these things. <laughs> so I'm gonna grab all four of these and rotate them around and so just so they're, I'm still using this dynamic place tool. You can see how cool it is that it respects uh, geometry here. Okay, something like that may, may be a little bit better. From here, I'm gonna hit play um, and just let it go until I'm getting a little bit more cloth. And somewhere around there, I'm going to start to uh, mess with some of our uh, materials. So I do wanna set up a nice camera angle because it's always more fun that way. And something like this might be just fine. Okay. Uh, I also need to rotate our light around a little bit. There we go. And 
so of course, this whole animation that Chad made, right? The, the, the thing that started this whole tutorial uh, was created to uh, promote our new uh, material collection. And uh, it's right here, it's called Pattern Canvas. And uh, these are beautiful uh, materials created specifically for cloth simulations and for beautiful detail. And they come with all these awesome patterns that you can also change the colors of, by the way. We're not gonna be doing that today, but you can go into any one of these and change the colors to your brand or your, your client's brand. Um, and they're really, really beautiful patterns here. And so this is what we're gonna use. Uh, let's, um, let's just go down to this polka dot one to start with. And I'm just gonna drag it up in into our viewport right on one of our little pillows here. And you're gonna see it updates in the viewport. And if we zoom in just a little bit, you're gonna see all that awesome detail. And because we did that UVing, that this looks like it's being created out of cloth. Uh, there's no stretching in the material. They all look like these little pieces of cloth that are puffing out and they have the stitching built in. And so what's cool about this is any of these patterns, even the ones that um, have more like straight lines to them like this, let's use, let's use this one instead. Um, the patterns are going to be straight, <laughs> right? Because we took that time in the UV section to straighten everything out and make it uh, a cross or a plus instead of an X, all these pieces look like they're coming from the material itself and made with real fabric. And this is a really big part of the look. And so now we could zoom out and start to add um, uh, materials to all of these. So let's just go ahead and add uh, some of my favorites here on geometry. And I'm gonna use a different one for each pillow because that's more fun. Bang. And I encourage you to do the same. Um, and if you have more time to calculate the dynamics, you could add more pillows, you could have different shapes, you can go back and make your own. But now you get the basics of how to set all of this stuff up. Um, okay, so now we have uh, uh, some basic materials here from the uh, pattern canvas. And by the way, if you don't, if you're not a Grayscale Gorilla Plus member, um, you can just make a material right up here by going to create Redshift Material Standard. And in your material, just go, uh, don't worry about nodes for now. Just go down here to your reflection roughness, which is way at the bottom here, and just turn this up. And this will give you something that uh, isn't a, a glossy material that you can then change the color of. And this will be fine uh, for your render. It just won't have all these, all this nice detail and patterns and all that stuff. Okay, so now that we're here, um, what can we do next? Well, let's add a background and then we're gonna talk about caching our geometry uh, and, and simulation. So uh, let's go ahead and add a new Redshift uh, dome light. And this is just gonna act as our background. So Redshift, lights, dome light. And by default, we're gonna get another white background and it's also adding all of this light to the scene. First of all, we don't want it to add light. So we can go into details under that new dome light and turn down diffuse. In fact, you could turn all this stuff down. And this is a nice way to have a background that is only affecting the background and, and not your scene. And uh, you, if you want a little fill light, actually, you could just turn up your diffuse here and this will just fill in some of the gaps uh, and basically give you like a, like a big fill light that will kind of get rid of some of the dark shadows. Um, you can also change the color so that it's not a pure white. So go in your object, go to color. In this case, uh, Let's pick something a little bit darker with a little bit more like a like a tan. No, not that bright, but something kind of subtle, but with a little bit of color, just a little bit of warmth. There we go. This looks pretty good. Um, okay, so we're we're getting some uh, good lighting. I think I need to maybe even turn this lighting up a little bit. So now let's talk about setting up our animation and making something a little bit more fun to look at. So I'm gonna turn off our IPR so we could look at the cloth itself. And if we hit play, you're gonna see, um, really all that's happening is uh, it's turning into pillows and then they're just kinda of hanging out here, <laughs> okay? And if you wanna just place some pillows on a couch somewhere, that's fine. You would just you would take a photo or do this animation. But we want them to swirl around and bounce off of each other and 
have this nice, uh, beautiful, simulated swirling feeling. So how do we do that? Um, well, for that, we're going to uh, use a field force. And so over in your object menu, hit Shift-C again and type in field, F-I-E-L-D, force. There it is right at the top. I'm going to hit Enter. It's going to add it to my scene. And field force, think of it kind of like the simulation forces menu, but uh, with a little bit more control and, and it allows you to kind of combine a lot of these together using fields. So how do you do it? Well, uh, for this animation in particular, we're going to go to field force under object and here are your fields. The first one we're going to add is a spherical field. This one's going to uh, make any object within that spherical field go toward the center of the scene, okay? So I'm just gonna grab our different uh, pluses here and move them away from the center, okay? And as soon as we hit play, you're gonna see they're all going to turn into pillows, but now they're also going to push toward the middle and start to collide with each other. And okay, so that that's more interesting already. So let's go back and go to our field force. And under this uh, object tab, you see velocity type, add to velocity. I'm just going to turn up to uh, the strength just, just to make this a little bit more strong, <laughs> a little bit more violent, a little bit more uh, like they really want to go toward the middle now. And when they hit, they're going to do all this nice pillowy, cushy, bzz, a little too much actually. <laughs> Okay, so that is what the um, spherical field is doing. Okay, so that's that's one way to, to add some animation. Well, what if you want it to be a little bit more random? Well, okay, let's turn off the spherical field for now and go into random field. And now we just added a random field. And so now let's hit play and see what random field does. Random field essentially is pulling different parts of these pillows in different directions. And it's almost like a turbulence. Um, but it's uh, right now it's not really animating as much as it is like pushing and pulling and poking in different parts of the pillows. But we can combine these together by going to our spherical field, turning it on and coming down to add on our random field. And now they're being added together. And more than that, we could dial the, them up and down. We could say, okay, I want less of the squish in effect. Let's tone that down a little bit. We want more of the random effect. And then you hit play and you see what happens. So here we go. They're being pushed in. And there's one other thing I'm seeing right here. We didn't really talk about the other settings for our soft bodies. So let's go into our, uh, our balloon. You can see we have the balloon icon. The icons change as we turn on and off different things. Um, but I'm gonna go back to the surface tab in this cloth tag. And under bendiness, we're gonna crank it up. And I think Chad had something really high in his, something like 200. And what this is gonna allow it to do is be more bubbly, more cloth, like let the cloth bend more. And I think this is gonna give us some more interesting effects with the pillowing and more wrinkles and little stuff like that. Okay, so now that we have that going on, um, what else can we add? Well, in the field force, we can come down and we could add another one called uh, radial field. Okay. What does radial field do? Let's turn off the other ones. Let's do add radial field. And you can see the field actually shows you what it's doing. If we zoom out and we look from above, we have these little markers in the field force that is like, all right, this is where the energy is going. It's going in circles. And if we hit play, uh, actually let's go back and hit play. You're going to see now the energy is swirling energy. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So what's cool is you can combine all of this to art direct and create anything you want. And the art direction part of this is really the what, what Cinema 4D does really well. It doesn't just give you simulation like, hey, do whatever you want, it, like let gravity just take it away. With these tools, with these um, vertex maps, with, with field forces, with combining fields together, um, we are now art directing and saying, okay, pillows, 
listen here, I want you to swirl around a little bit. And then when I tell you to, I want to crank up this spherical field and have you all smashed together in the middle. And then uh, maybe I turn that down overall. And then, and then maybe you fling out into space or something. This is all now art directable by you and controllable. And now it's just a matter of dialing it in and, and running the simulation and seeing uh, what it, what it does. So I'm just going to dial this stuff in until I get something kind of interesting. Right now, they're spinning. They're all coming towards the middle. And maybe there's too much spin, so we could turn down the radial field. And I do want them to squish together more so I can come in here. And we can animate all this too. You can, uh, for example, use signal, let's say, and, and go into um, uh, your spherical field directly and just animate these uh, strengths up and down. So you could say, okay, with the strength off, it's not really pulling toward the middle. And you could see it's more moving around the side. And then you could say, okay, right here, I wanna crank it up and then I want you to all fight for the middle. And here they go, they're starting to move towards the middle and they all crunch together. And then maybe you let this run a few extra frames and then you say, right around here, I want you to ignore the strength and now you're more flinging out into space. This can be combined with different shapes, with different um, uh, forces and mix and matching all of this stuff to really help you art direct exactly what you want. So as we get towards a final render, I'm going to scale up some of these objects and down some of these just so we get a little bit of variation. I'm also gonna pull them out a little bit further, and this is gonna allow us to just get a little bit more pushing in, pulling, more swirling, and more energy since they're further away from the center. And from here, uh, again, we're just dialing this up and down. And before we cache all of this, I also wanted to talk briefly about the re uh, simulation settings. So hit Control D on your keyboard, this is gonna open up your simulation tab. Under your simulation tab, this is where we turned off our gravity. You could also see simulation, bam. In here, you're gonna see things like subset, sub steps, iterations, um, and these all have a huge impact on your final animation. Um, if you have collisions that are intersecting, if, if there's cloth that's intersecting, you wanna make sure you turn up things like your iterations and your um, passes, collisions right here. You wanna say extra iterations, turn this up. If you have intersecting, this is a great one to mess with. In our case, um, we just want to slow down some of this ballooning. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna turn up our iterations to something like five. Let's back it out. And I don't think we need much more than that. Maybe a little bit, of, uh, little bit more damping uh, I'm going to set this to four. This is going to um, keep all the wrinkles, but it's going to make the kind of ballooning a little bit less. And this looks actually more soft and more cushy to me. <laughs> so again, very, very settings dependent, but, um, but it calculates quickly enough to where I think you could play with this and start to get looks that you like. All right. I already like this. This frame right here is like this big, oh, I, I moved it. Let me undo that. This like this big plus is hugging the small plus. I freaking love it. Let's hit play on our IPR and see what this looks like. This looks really, really fun. Uh, let's move our lighting around just so we can get a little bit more lighting. Boom. And there's just too much of the same pattern here. I want to break it up a little bit. So I am going to go to something like this here and just drag this on top of this giant plus. This is gonna lighten our, our color palette a little bit. Okay, that's great. You can see the canvas texture. This one's given, this one's a nice big hug. And now we can start to uh, create our final render. And it's at this point when you wanna stop thinking like um, a 3D creator artist and start thinking like a um, filmmaker. Where would you put the camera? Where would you put the lights? What emotions are you trying to uh, pull out of this animation? And, and in this case, I want this really um, pillowy feel, right? Like I know, like Chad made this original one, and we're trying to recreate it. But what was what to me made that really beautiful is the swirling effect, which we're starting to get, 
and also the the little details of the lighting that allow this to show off the material, right? Because this was made to show off materials, we wanna make sure that that is happening. So there's a couple things we should do while we're here, while we're kind of looking at this frame, um, as we start to dial in the lighting and materials. Well, to me, the first one I see is the difference in scale of these different uh, canvases. Remember we scaled this one up and then this one's smaller? Well, now it's showing the differences in the canvas. And if this was all made by a similar type of fabric, well, this wouldn't be so much larger. See how big the pattern is compared to this one, for example? Well, we can adjust that. Just select that object. And this is, uh, we just go to this texture. And in this texture, we can add more tiles. So something like 1.4, 1 1.4 1 in our tiles is going to shrink this down. And you could just do this by eye. You could say, okay, that's roughly the same scale. And then you could do the same with this one as well. So you can just click it over here. It's this one, go into that material tag. And under the tag, you can add a little, a little bit more tiles. This probably needs less, 1.2, 1.2. And this is gonna shrink it down just enough to, to try to match the canvas so that they all look like they're built from the same scale canvas. And if we, uh, if if you if I exaggerated it, for example, and I I set this to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, you're going to see a really a bad example of this. See now how big that is. This is what you're trying to avoid. Okay. So as you uh, slap different shapes and things together, uh, think about all of that. Okay. So usually when I get something that's looking pretty decent, I also start to save it, folks. <laughs> so maybe we should do that. I'm gonna go over here and go to uh, save project as, and uh, I'm just gonna call this uh, a pillow uh, t t tutorial 001. All right, and now now we uh, now we got something. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, this is usually when I'll start to cache the animation and start to, uh, like I was saying earlier, start to think more like a filmmaker. Uh, like a like a director and less like a 3D artist. And so how do we do that? Well, let's cache this animation by going over to our cloth tags. In this case, they look like balloons because we turned on our balloon uh, settings. And we wanna go uh, make sure they're all selected, go to cache, and uh, I usually go to frame zero. I don't think you have to do that, but I like doing that. Go to frame zero. I'm gonna turn off our IPR and I'm gonna click on cache scene. All right, so the cache just finished. It only took uh, maybe a couple minutes, but now that we have this, we now can scrub through the timeline and we get our animation here without having to wait for it to calculate. It is now baked. And what uh, this allows us to do now is, now all we have to worry about is a beautiful camera angle and beautiful materials and beautiful lighting and, and worrying about that part rather than the animation. Okay, and if we're not happy with that calculation, all we have to do is come in here, say clear scene cache, change our field force settings, right? Come in here, you can animate this stuff and dial it up and down and maybe add different ones, experiment, get to something that you think might look pretty good, hit cache again and repeat until you get something that you love. In this case, I think we have a pretty cool kind of smash together effect. And uh, I wish we animated it kind of like separating here. Uh, you could you could animate that if you want, just like turn down the uh, spherical field and that way they'll kind of fall apart. But I think for this, it's fine. We have a nice little squishy. This uh, big plus is hugging the little plus. I kind of like that vibe. And now we can worry about our lighting and our final details to get that extra little bit of sexiness in our render before we hit the final render. So let's dial up our IPR and let's find a beautiful camera angle. So this is probably my favorite part of the animation where they're all coming together, okay, right there. And I want to accentuate that. I wanna make sure that this kind of cushiness is captured in a way. So I, I wanna frame essentially for this moment and say, okay, right there where they all kind of come together is a cool, it, this is a cool moment. And if you think of it this way, you can, you can now, frame for this moment, then dial in your lighting. And this isn't, this is really something I didn't think about until I was talking to Chad about it. He's like, 
worry about the lighting last. Worry about your camera first. Like, where are you going to put your camera? Okay, this is a good place. Now that you have that, let's adjust the lighting to, um, to make it as beautiful as possible, right? And so now that we have our frame that I think looks pretty cool, we have our plus, we have our big one or small one, we can now go to our light, go to coordinates, and uh, just use our sliders here to kind of pull a little bit more light around and try to get a beautiful moment. Now there's kind of too much light and not enough shadow here. So maybe there's another uh, another camera angle we can play with here. This one's kind of cool too, where they both kind of smash into each other. Maybe here. All right, let's try that one. And then again, we're just gonna match the lighting by pulling the light over to the left, and now we get a nice dark area and a and a bright area. So now we can we can back this up and see what this looks like coming in. So this might be pretty cool. We got this frame, and then and then it's gonna smash together there, and this could be a good place to kind of keep our camera. Boom. Okay, that looks pretty. That looks pretty nice. Okay. Um, so we set up our camera. Let's start to dial in our final little tweaks that makes this go from a good looking render to a great looking render. And by the way, this is when Chad started showing me some tips and tricks that I'm really excited to show you. I've never really done too much inside of uh, Redshift before that I think um, may help you with some things or just really give you those last little tips that uh, make it look better. So first one is, Obviously, we need to add some depth of field. We need to add some real camera detail. Um, because we set up our scene with natural scale, uh, we can use natural camera lenses and f-stops to get uh, realistic looks. What this means is um, we, can ch we already chose a, a lens that we would shoot this with, something like a 50 millimeter, but now we can come in here to the physical tab inside our Redshift camera and select an f-stop. And if you're a photographer, you know there are some common f-stops to use when you're indoor, or you have a flash, um, to get a little bit of depth of field, but not too much. And in this case, something like a four f-stop uh, is usually what you would use in like a studio situation, right? And maybe a six, but let's start with a four. Um, so we set our f-stop. The other thing we need to do is go into our Redshift tag. And this is also true with uh, other third-party renderers, Octane. You gotta go turn on the depth of field. In this case, we go to our Bokeh tab, click on Override, click on Enabled, and uh, you're done. Uh, just kidding. You have to tell it what to be in focus and what not to be. Um, so you could do this right in Redshift just by clicking this uh, dot here and then just selecting what you wanna be in focus. And now you're seeing uh, why we used real world scale, real world lenses. We get this beautiful natural uh, bokeh and little bit of blurriness here in the background. And, and it, it actually makes the, the canvas stand out even more because it's surrounded by slightly out of focus things, right? Automatically gives it that, that realistic feel. Very subtle, but again, we're gonna do a few things here that are subtle, but add to the realness. Okay, so we have our f-stop, we have our focus, um, and, and you, you can also use a focus null if you wanna experiment with that. We have a tutorial all about a focus null as well. Uh, I'll make sure to link that up uh, in, the, in the description and here on YouTube. Uh, for that, you could just click a null, and I usually call it focus, and down in your Redshift camera, go to object, and drag in your focus null right here on focus object. Now, instead of using this thing, now you could just grab the focus null and you can grab the place tool, which is right here, and you can click on any part of this animation uh, over here and it will stick this null directly to that object. And now, no matter where you put your camera, whether it's far away or way up close, this will always remain in focus. This is really powerful. It's been a part of my workflow for a few months now and I can't live without it. I had to include it in this tutorial as well. Um, all right, so now we have our focus. We have our lighting dialed in. What else can we do to add these little subtle differences? Um, 
this is where Chad showed me this menu right here. So um, if you don't see this gear icon in your Redshift, it probably means it's being hidden, kind of like mine, right? There's just not enough screen real estate to get to this little gear icon. So Redshift included this little button, click this button, and then right down here, you're gonna see this gear. So this gear is gonna open up a bunch of basically compositing and extra things that you could add to your scene. Uh, things like color management. Uh, and then the two things that we're gonna uh, look at is LUTs and color controls. So first of all is LUT. If you haven't played with LUTs, we have Grayscale Gorilla LUTs that come with Grayscale Gorilla Plus. And essentially they're uh, lookup tables that allow you different lighting scenarios, um, different film emulation, diff uh, different color grading uh, for your renders that give you different looks. In this case, we're gonna use one of the built-in Redshift ones. And this is one that Chad said he uses all the time whenever he wants a warm kind of feeling. And with this um, pillow animation, we want a warm kind of feeling, right? <laughs> we want we want to uh, make this feel like you're at home and, and that these pillows are comfortable and something warm. So Chad showed me this. He said, uh, I, I, he says he uses this LUT all the time. Um, and I, I'm excited to show you guys. So you turn on LUTs, you get a LUT file and you go to Advantix 200. And you can see by default, uh, it's got this awesome warm look to it. Let's turn it off. This is what it looked like before. It looks great. But now look at all the warmth and the extra kind of contrastiness that we get to on this scene. And in fact, it's a little bit strong for me. I might even pull it back. If anything's too strong, but you like the feeling, you just go to LUT strength and dial it down. I'm gonna go to something more like 50%. And this already feels better, especially with these colors. I love how it just kind of makes these oranges pop out a little bit more. Um, and then right below it, we're gonna play with curves. Man, curves, I love curves. I've been a fan <laughs> since my photography Photoshop days. Um, and frankly, I didn't even know this was here. Uh, Chad showed me this and he says, you know, for a quick little adjustment and so you don't have to composite this later, you can just dial this in right in the viewport and that way when you hit render, it's done and you don't have to go bring it in After Effects or whatever to do your final little color. So not for everybody, you know, sometimes you wanna do a, a full composite, but man, when you're working fast, it's really nice to have these curves right here. So in this case, I'm just gonna click on uh, uh, the upper part and lower part of this curve and create a really basic S curve. Now you can go too far with it, <laughs> but I just wanna be really subtle here and just add a little bit more contrast in the in the black areas and a little bit more pop in the white. And again, you don't wanna go too far, but now let's A, B, test this. Um, we could turn on and off our curves. You could see the contrast right there. And then we could turn on and off our LUT. And these things combine to make subtle differences that add warmth and a little bit of contrast and a little bit of style to your render. So now if we turn this off, um, I'm really liking how this looks. Uh, let's check it in different frames. So let's go back here. Love that. I love how blurry this is and how sharp this is. This is kind of coming into frame out of focus. And because we cache this, we can go pretty quickly now into this mode. That's looking really beautiful. Um, the, the canvas looks good, the patterns look good. Let's scroll forward. That's looking good. It's a little bit bright, um, but I think that's okay. I think for this animation, it's kind of like, it's kind of like done as soon as we get here. This is really the key part of it. It's like the from here, let's look at the start. It's not quite pillowy, but I think essentially we'll start this animation here. It's gonna come together. They're gonna collide, bam, it's looking nice. And then right about here, it's probably done. And I think it's ready to go. Um, okay, so uh, oh, I moved my focus. I'm gonna undo that. I'm just gonna click on my startup uh, tab just to go back to my regular uh, layout. So because I messed it all up there, I'm gonna click my IPR one last time to just kind of double check our lighting, make sure everything's looking good making sure we're ready to go. And from here, I think we're ready to render folks. Um, you know, it, this is really straightforward. You can go to your output, uh, go to 
current frame and turn this to all frames. You wanna pick a place to save this here. And uh, instead of a TIFF 8-bit, I usually do a 16-bit, especially for final renders. And uh, I think we're ready. Uh, Redshift medium is usually my first render no matter what. Um, and if you start to see graininess and it's not high enough res, uh, or essentially you're just looking for grain. And with a little bit of depth of field, I think we could get away with medium. I would start with medium, keep an eye on it. And if you are seeing uh, graininess in your blurry areas, crank it up to high. Now there's a lot more with settings and we have videos on all that stuff, of course. But for this uh, render, I think we did it, folks. And hopefully there's something here that has spurred some ideas and just really understanding the power of some of these new simulation tools and how you could use them to really quickly create some awesome, beautiful animations here in cinema. Thanks again for watching everybody. And if you end up creating something using this technique, we'd love to see it down in the comments below. And if you're new here at Grayscale Gorilla and you've watched this far, then consider subscribing and hitting the notifications icon so that you're notified when we put out new tutorials just like this. So with that, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today in this tutorial, and we hope to see you in another video really soon. Bye everybody.